Throughout history, humans have always loved to party. And black people, from our Juneteenth celebrations to our church fish fries to soul train lines at family cookouts to our Burberry shirt and barbecue meatball baby showers, know how to party. While there are tons of celebrations across regions and cultures, you already know that I wanna talk about black American party history, right? How were early 20th century Harlemites highlighting a major New York issue? What did Southern shindigs in blues country say about the labor industry? What was the real magic of Freaknik and why was it shut down? You might be surprised to learn that black parties have represented, challenged, and embodied political, economic, and social discourse. You might also be surprised to know that Freaknik was never the freakiest type of party. So why don't you grab a snack, roll a blunt, or pour a beverage, and let's turn up with four kinds of black American parties. Also, this might make you a bit hungry, so be warned. Before you go to a party, you always check to make sure your outfit is on point and that your hair is too, right? While I love a good wig or some braids, I love going to a party with my Afro puffs. Shout out to this video's sponsor, MD Hair. I've been using their amazing products for four months now and my hair is thicker and healthier than it was the last time I showed you guys in a black women's history of hair. I had to move the camera back because my puffs are so tall now. I took the online quiz and uploaded a picture of my scalp and got this customized kit, which includes shampoo, conditioner, supplement, serum, and collagen powder. My favorite things to do were oiling my scalp with the serum and adding the collagen powder to my post-workout dark chocolate protein shakes. I don't taste a thing, and it's been helping my hair. MD Hair Products includes over 100 natural ingredients that are clean and sustainable. Your subscription even comes with free 24-7 medical chat with dermatologists and registered nurses. Use the link in my description box to take your quiz and get a free scalp analysis and get 70% off your first month of customized products when you use my code INTMEDIA70. I can't help it, okay. Um, whether you wanna make your hair thicker, grow it longer, or just make it healthier, MD Hair can help you reach your hair goals. I can't wait to see my puffs in a few months. Black people have lived in the area now known as Harlem since the 1630s. Mass migration into the area began in 1905. By 1920, Harlem was 32% black and mainly renting apartments from Jewish landlords. Between 1920 and 1930, a total 118,792 white people left the neighborhood for Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and Westchester, and 87,417 black people arrived. Because neighborhoods outside of Harlem often refused to rent to black people and so many black people moved in, racist and predatory landlords kept the rent higher than anywhere else in the city. According to historian Nicholas L. Gaffney, between 1919 and 1927, the average monthly rental rate for Harlem's black residents doubled from $21 to $22 a month to just over $41 a month. In modern money, that's equivalent to rent jumping from approximately $366 to $711. That's a big jump, right? Black Harlemites spent approximately 45% of their income on housing, which is comparable to the average U.S. renters of today spending 30% of their income on rent. Ouch. Ever exuding the hustling spirit, black people got creative in urban cities like Chicago and Detroit, but particularly in Harlem. They opened up their homes for friends and neighbors to mingle, de-stress, and turn up. Rent parties required little startup costs and had guaranteed returns. These soirees included live music that often included cutting contests in which two musicians would battle it out for the crowd's favor. It was very similar to modern day dance and rap battles. Food was offered for the cheap with delicacies like fried chicken, fried fish, corn, pig's feet, pork chops, and potato salad being the standard. Many of Harlem's residents were recent transplants from the South, and they brought dishes like chitlins and Hop and John with them. Plus, nearly a quarter of Harlem's black population was foreign born in the 1920s. And you can bet your ass the menus were reflecting imported dishes like jerk chicken and ackee and salt fish. 
selfish. In addition to food, rent party attendees were excited for cheap and abundant liquor, which wasn't always easy to find thanks to prohibition. It was common for rent party throwers to brew up gin or other concoctions in their bathtubs. A popular beverage was King Kong or homemade corn whiskey. These shindigs raged from the 20s through the 50s and thrived on secrecy. Among the writer Langston Hughes's possessions were numerous rent party invitations, and these cards had clever rhymes on them with discreet instructions and information. Read one card from 1955 held by someone named Rose. You can wake up the devil, raise all the hell, no one will be there to go home and tell. If you brought the card to 2213 8th Avenue, apartment 5, you could get in for 35 cents. If you showed up without an invite, you were getting waxed at 50 cents. Rent parties were especially intriguing for black people new to the city. Harlem's fanciest clubs were expensive and attracted white tourists. For instance, the Cotton Club only entertained white audiences. Described a WPA interviewer, transplants would stroll the avenue until they saw some flat with a red, pink, or blue light in the window. The plug of a tin panty piano and sounds of half tipsy Mary making fleeting out into the night air. Then they would venture in, be greeted volubly by the hostess, and eventually steered to the kitchen where refreshments were for sale. And 50 cents to be introduced to a whole network of new people was a steal. Rent parties were extremely popular because of this cheapness and also because you were meeting a whole new network of people. 25 to 50 cents could get you a night of dancing, reefer, liquor, gambling, new friends, and fun. And sometimes these celebrations didn't end until 7 or 8 a.m. I wish modern parties lasted that long. They be kicking us out at 2 a.m. Chat the lights come on. I'll be like, damn, I'm not done. I'm, I'm still trying to have fun. But they be like, go home. Though rent parties were often on Saturday, that wasn't always the case. According to that same WPA interviewer, Thursday particularly became a favorite in view of the fact that sleep-in domestic workers had a day off and were free to kick up their heels without restraint. But the majority of working class Negroes, maids, porters, elevator operators, and the like were paid on Saturday. And more important than that, were not required to report to work on Sunday. Saturday, therefore, became the logical night to pitch and carry on. According to Alex Haley, or Malcolm X, during his early time in Harlem when he wasn't being a Pullman porter, people offering you little cards advertising rent raising parties. I went to one of these, 30 or 40 Negroes sweating, eating, drinking, dancing, and gambling in a jammed, beat up apartment, the record player going full blast, the fried chicken or chitlins with potato salad and collard greens for a dollar a plate, and cans of beer or shots of liquor for 50 cents. Rent parties often overlapped with buffet flats or pussy parties, home-based speakeasies that similarly offered booze, food, gambling, reefer, and more explicitly, sex. Due to the fluid and clandestine nature of these parties, the lines between what was a rent party and what was a buffet flat was fine. Some recurring rent parties turned into pussy parties, like according to one woman, we rented rooms for just a little while during the party. At first, I was a little shocked at the utter boldness of it. One day a man came along and there was no one to take care of him. Hazel asked me if I would take care of him. I thought about it for a while, then made up my mind to do it. Well, that was the last of domestic work for me. I figured that I was a fool to go out and break my back scrubbing floors, washing, ironing, and cooking when I could earn three days pay or more in 15 minutes. Noted LaShawn Harris and sex workers, psychics, and number runners, black women in New York's underground economy. Abyssinian Baptist Church pastor Adam Clayton Powell Sr. was shocked to find out that several women in his congregation organized rent parties and buffet flats. While some participated in the sexual activities, others were maids or cooking up sandwiches, salads, steaks, and chops. The other component of these parties was the ways in which queer black people could congregate in safety. Queer buffet flats were hosted for many of the same attendees who also went to Harlem's many drag balls, featuring cross-dressing and alternative gender expression for spectating white audiences. Early versions of the drag balls that would be central to the black and Latino LGBTQ communities of the 80s. But when queer black Harlemites of the 20s through 50s wanted to express themselves away from white spectators, there were rent parties and buffet flats. Explained by sexual singer Bessie Smith, a buffet flat is nothing but F words and bull daggers. Buffet means everything goes on. Though rent parties and buffet flats weren't the exact same things, they often overlapped. Rent parties were cheap and authentic slices of Harlem that allowed black residents to supplement their income and cultivate community culture during a continuing period of racist rental policies and wealth inequality. Wrote historian Robin D.G. Kelly, black working people of both sexes shook and twisted their overworked bodies, drank, talked, engaged in sexual play, and in spite of the occasional 
fights reinforced their sense of community. As the parties rolled on, the living quarters became even more packed, even more expensive, and less maintained, sweeping in problems that would plague the boroughs in the 60s and 70s. But that's another video for another day. Pioneering cultural anthropologist and author Zora Neale Hurston in the characteristics of Negro expression. Juke is the word for a Negro pleasure house. It may mean a body house. It may mean the house set apart on public works where the men and women dance, drink, and gamble. Often, it is a combination of all these. The word juke itself has a debated origin, with some saying it comes from the Juba dance, a style of dance brought from the Congo by enslaved people in Charleston, South Carolina. Others attribute it to the Gullah Geek word juke meaning infamous or disorderly, an evolution of the Wolof word jug meaning disorderly. Juke places have been around in some form or another since slavery, when enslaved people would leave plantations with or without permission to secretive parties in the woods. As blues music gained popularity in the Jim Crow South, event spaces popped up in shacks, sheds, and old barns. Many were allowed to operate on the land of white sharecroppers who owned the labor, homes, profits, and debt of the black people who lived there. Juke joints would have odd and inconsistent hours, often reliant on the schedules of traveling musical acts or the people who owned them. They also thrived on relative secrecy, meaning people who came to juke joints usually knew everybody else. These spaces often catered to the working class black laborers from work camps, turpentine or sawmill camps, as well as sharecroppers. A lot of the food served at these places was usually cooked outside very informally due to the lack of kitchens, making fried fish and barbecue popular choices. Jukes featured a bunch of dancing that was usually considered obscene and lewd, my favorite kind of dancing, involving close touching, hugging, and grinding. This includes the slow drag, which scandalized white critics when it was later introduced on stage in a 1929 Broadway production. Do you know how turnt I would personally be doing the slow drag when Bessie Smith's Empty Bed Blues came on? That song sadly doesn't come into public domain until next year, but here's one of the lyrics. He's a deep sea diver with a stroke that can't go wrong. And if you need to know what deep sea diver means, be sure to check out a history of oral sex. In the early 1900s, when juke joints officially entered the radar, they quickly acquired negative reputations as places for sex work, gambling, violence, and murder. Because of the privacy bubble of these spaces, as well as the misogyny of the era, it could get ugly. Recalled one juke joint attendee of the 1960s, if you stayed there till about 10 o'clock and didn't nothing happen, you better go on home because from about 11 o'clock on, there's gonna be some shooting going on. Some guy's gonna whoop his old lady about dancing with somebody. Some proprietors took extra measures to keep their clientele safe, with one juke joint out near Lakeland, Florida, informing customers that anyone shooting a gun in these quarters will be charged $5 and required to forfeit the gun or to go to jail. Some jukes didn't allow women, and others cut off people who got too drunk. Because many were operating in dry states or counties, they paid off local law enforcement to look the other way from the free-flowing liquor. As the years wore on, some spaces got juke organs, allowing customers to slide in a nickel to strike up a phonograph. And by the way, there were white juke joints too, though they were often referred to as honky-tonks and roadhouses. Roadhouse. But in the first half of the century in the Mississippi Delta, the area with the highest proportion of black Americans and the birthplace of blues and rock and roll, juke joints were especially sacred. Another important area of juke joint activity was in Florida. The state would lead the nation in lynchings per capita between 1882 and 1930. Surrounded by sundown towns with dangerous curfews, the only places for a private and safe outing for many black people were often juke joints. Take this 1941 photograph of the Pines juke joint out in Belle Glade, Florida. In Marigold, Mississippi, sometime between 1954 and 1961, William Seabury, a teenage sharecropper, and his older brother began operating Poe Monkey's Juke Joint out of a former sharecropper shack made of tin and plywood, held together with nails, staples, and wires on Hyder Farm. Seabury, who was known as Monkey, moved into the shack in 1963 and eventually added a pool room, stage area, kitchen, and bedroom. Locals relied on word of mouth to know 
when Monkey would be opening the doors, as Poe Monkeys was never listed in any directory, yellow pages, map, or other official guide. If you found the location and saw a string of Christmas lights turned on, you knew the juke was open for business that night. Poe Monkey's juke became legendary, and in the 90s it was attracting college students from Delta State University who wanted to experience an authentic juke with blues music. In the 1990s, college students and blues enthusiasts became a central component of juke joint clientele because of the legalization of riverboat casinos and gambling in Mississippi. The first one opened in 1992. Other juke joints had similar nights of college and middle class patrons who'd pay around $5 for the authentic juke experience. A photojournalist who interviewed juke joint owners in 2000 found that many were losing customers and charging more. Riverboat casinos lured away customers with free food, music, and drinks. Juke joints just couldn't compete. In the 2000s, Po Monkeys was no longer open on weekends because of the wealth of nightlife options, but it still opened its doors on Thursdays for mostly middle-aged black men and women, and Mondays for a rowdier crowd featuring, like many juke joints desperate for customers, tea shows. Reported the New York Times, on Mondays, the strippers make the two-hour drive from Memphis to work a raunchier crowd for tips. Po Monkeys had a few rules, though, including no loud music, no dope smoking, and no rap music. Monkey himself outlawed baggy pants and was known to change into different colored suits whenever the joint was open, described southern spaces. In his lounge, he favors bright, color-coordinated suits with matching belt buckles, derby or cowboy hats, and boots. If he's feeling up to it, he changes clothing in his bedroom every hour or so and emerges, strutting as if on a fashion show runway in baby blue, bright white, crimson, yellow, plaid, or even highly reflective silver. Poe Monkeys held lively functions until 2016 when Willie Monkey Seabury died at the age of 75. For most of his ownership of the juke, he still worked as a farmer. Very rarely were juke joints financially lucrative. Instead, they were communal nightlife options for people with no other options. There are a few exceptions, however. About 115 miles south of the Mississippi Highway 61 crossroads, where urban legend says blue artist Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil for the ability to play music is one of the oldest branded jukes, the Blue Front Cafe, which opened in 1948 under a Bentonia couple named Carrie and Mary Holmes, who owned 80 acres of farmland right in the heart of the Mississippi blues movement. The center block building became a prized piece of blues history, serving up buffalo fish and bootleg moonshine whiskey and deviled eggs to local workers from the Yazoo County cotton fields. Per the Mississippi blues trail down database. The Blue Front was subject to a 10 p.m. town curfew, but at the height of cotton gathering and ginning season, the cafe might stay open 24 hours a day to serve shifts of workers around the clock. This shows the importance of juke joints to the local economies that exploited black labor. Where else were underpaid and overworked laborers going to go to blow off steam? The money generated from the Blue Front Cafe, which sold groceries and did haircuts in addition to hosting events with live blues music and serving hot meals, generated enough money for the family to raise 10 children and three nephews on, who also worked the 80 acres of farmland. Still, Jimmy Duck Holmes was warned by his parents when he took over the business in 1970. My mama sat me down and told me, boy, there will come a time when you think you'll get rich at the blue front, but that ain't guaranteed. This place has its ups and downs. Musicians would show up, perform without a stage, with a chair and a tip bucket. The Blue Front Cafe has stayed in the family ever since. Currently owned by Grammy Award nominated Jimmy Duck Holmes, a blue singer and has received a historical marker from Mississippi. A 2017 article mentioned the little building receiving blues pilgrims from Australia, the United Kingdom, California, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Said Holmes, a family from London was here yesterday. A husband, a wife, and two kids. The kid could play a little bit, so he got back there and messed around. They were delighted. Blue Front Cafe also hosts an annual Bentonia Blues Festival, which has had live music since 1973. While there are several jukes that achieved fame like Poe Monkeys and the Blue Front Cafe, many were undocumented, inconsistently operated, and have thus faded into obscurity. These important secular spaces of joy and self-expression served as relief from racism, poverty, and reality. 
60s and early 70s, the Bronx was reeling from the consequences of city planner Robert Moses' urban renewal project, which condemned and obliterated neighborhoods to make way for the Cross Bronx Expressway. In the process, creating vacant lot, limiting job and housing opportunities, increasing crime, and suspicious arson potentially by landlords looking for insurance payouts. Plus, there was gang activity. On August 21st, 1973, an enterprising young teenager named Cindy Campbell held a party in the recreation room she rented from her apartment for $25 at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. Her decision to invest the money made her a hip hop promoter and legend, showing how women have always been central to the genre. With her eyes on a fresh back to school wardrobe, Cindy held a back to school jam and hand wrote invitations on index cards. The event was DJed by her brother Clive, who went by DJ Cool Herc, and spun records featuring James Brown's Sex Machine on a huge turntable with speakers. In touch with his dance hall roots, he incorporated toasting, or contemporary patois and slang infused rhyming, which, along with the black American tradition of the dozens, or roast battles of wits and insults, laid the groundwork for rap. After charging 25 cents for girls and 50 cents for boys, the Jamaican American siblings made $300 and had acquired a reputation for throwing the hottest party the Bronx may have ever seen. The fact that it was from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. alone is iconic. Look, I know we can't go back to the party all night until 8 a.m. like during the rent party days, but can we please go back to clubs closing at 4? please? But because the rec room space wasn't that big, the party spilled outside and became what would be the first hip hop block party. Though block parties have existed in some shape or form since the beginning of America's urban centers, the hip hop block parties of the 70s were the introduction of the culture that will become a multi-billion dollar industry, fostering black expressions in fashion, rap, and dance. DJ Herc would spin at a bunch of parties, many publicized and booked by Cindy, but the block parties at Cedar Park brought thousands of attendees to dance the night Away. These became massively popular events, especially because Bronx clubs were becoming less pleasant from gang activity and uptown clubs were catering to a disco clientele. The black and Latino guys and girls who danced to Herc's innovative style of music became b-boys and b-girls, who expanded on break dancing, which began with street kids and stoop kids entertaining themselves. Explained a dancer, everybody would form a circle and the b-boys would go into the center. At first the dance was simple, touch your toes, hop, kick out your leg, then some guy went down down, spun around on all fours, everybody said wow and went home to try to come up with something better. The culture that thrived and grew in these Bronx parties would become central to the black experience everywhere. Also, one of those handwritten invitations went for $27,000 in a Christie's auction, as well as even higher prices for turntables and other memorabilia from the siblings who cultivated the hip hop block party. Picnic began in Atlanta in March 1983 as a relatively small picnic featuring sandwiches, coolers, and boom boxes for HBCU students in the Atlanta University Center during spring break. When a bunch of members from the DC Metro Club were bored and stuck on campus, they threw the first picnic in Piedmont Park. The name for Freak Nick was inspired by two songs, Freak by Chic and Freak of the Week by Funkadelic, with a student named Rico Brown saying, let's call it Freak Nick. Shout out to Rico Brown. The money made from the first Freak Nick went to local charities. Due to a lack of social media and publicity, the early days of the picnic saw mostly college attendees who had heard about the event from word of mouth. Throughout the rest of the 80s, they gathered in various parks and brought their grills, blankets, boom boxes, and food with them, and eventually things got a little more rowdy. Said one attendee, I remember me and three of my homeboys with me driving down I-85, approaching the baseball stadium, and some girls from North Carolina were honking their horn trying to get us to pull over. We pulled over at a gas station, exchanged numbers, and ended up hooking up that night. It was a wild time. This was certainly one of the main draws of Freak Nick, but it wasn't the only one. By the 90s, the weekend event served up basketball tournaments, a job fair, and musical performances. Plus, networking was a key feature of Freak Nick. Think about it, this is pre-internet. Where else would you meet a bunch of other black college students in one place? If I would have been at Ohio State in the 90s, you best believe I would have drove my ass from Columbus down to Atlanta faithfully every year. Freak Nick was 
bringing in millions of dollars to Atlanta annually. It was becoming an event where new black artists could come and show off their music at parties and hopeful entrepreneurs could throw parties and sell merch. Freak Nick was all about turning up, getting loose, and being seen, and letting off some steam too. In addition to Uncle Luke's 1993 music video, Work It Out, which featured Freak Nick, the shift from park area parties to car cruising really put the event on the map. First, there were over 100,000 attendees. No event had ever brought together so many young black people for nothing but fun. No marching or with pain in mind, just fun. However, all that fun in the streets led to a gridlock that blocked the area from Piedmont Park to Peachtree Street to the West End, blocking people from leaving their homes and stopping businesses from operating. City Council member and mayoral candidate Bill Campbell defended Freaknik, saying that the event just needed to be ironed out with better policing and planning rather than being banned. He and others looked at it as a test run for hosting the Olympics in 1996. Meanwhile, business owners and civic leaders tried to throw alternate events like the Atlanta Black College Spring Break Celebration and Freak Fest 94, but both failed. In preparation for the real deal Freak Nick 94, the city council approved $175,000 for security and cleanup and hope for the best. Atlanta residents, meanwhile, weighed in with the Atlanta Constitution. While a white man said there was no need for Freak Nick and a white woman cried that even though she stood for civil rights, she was told to move out of the way, white bitch, by a party goer. An astute reader said, the same residents who complained about the Freak Nick parties are the ones who will continually complain about the traffic and parking problems that are associated with other events held in Piedmont Park. I have one question for them. Why did you move to Midtown near Piedmont Park? Said another reader, perhaps had the students been blonde, blue-eyed, Ivy League types, Freak Nick would have been perceived for what it was, just another college romp. Freak Nick 1994 was scheduled to have performances by artists like Snoop Dogg and Queen Latifah. I know my mama was mad she couldn't go because she just had me. It's no surprise that over 200,000 people showed up. Not my mama though. This generated $80 million in revenue for the city of Atlanta. Not everybody was pleased. Said a Clark Atlanta University student, having fun isn't just being a freak. This is another example of Freak Nick being representative of larger social conversations happening among black people in the 90s, particularly about hip hop. There were intense debates about the growing misogyny and violence in hip hop, best exemplified by the activism of C. Dolores Tucker. Freak Nick was caught up in this discourse because artists like Diddy, Jermaine Dupri, Outkast, and others went to local events, blasted their music, and did guerrilla marketing. Local clubs held concerts featuring hip hop. And while there were certainly valid criticisms of hip hop's misogyny as well as sexual assaults at Freak Nick, conservative black Americans completely rejected any notion of sexual positivity that prioritizes consent. Sexuality isn't negative, but black college students were being held to a standard that many white college students were not. To revoke stereotypes that black people are lascivious and poorly behaved. They were expected to be better than the stereotypes and white students, said future Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed. A 1991 Howard grad who attended the early Freakniks, I think that Freaknik was a good thing, until it wasn't, until it lost its essence. It stopped being about black students having a good time and took on an all-star game type of feel. It really became a black Daytona Beach. The Freakniks in 94 and 95 saw an increase in reported rapes, robberies, assaults, and gridlocks. Videos from this era show all kinds of black people, including non-students, doing a bunch of erotic stuff. There's also footage of men debating whether or not consent depended on what women were wearing and I could not find this video when I was researching it. I had it bookmarked, don't know what happened to it. If I find it, I'll link it in the comments. The months leading up to Freak Nick 95 were contentious. As Republicans called for an end to affirmative action, HBCU funding, and other stuff will address intellectual does the 90s, Freak Nick was used as political fodder in the ongoing cultural wars that were growing increasingly partisan. Rumors circulated that the event would be canceled and that the House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who had just come into power, planned to have the American Heritage Foundation record Freak Nick 95 so that there was evidence that the black college student is wasting the government's money. Now, that didn't happen, but this is hilarious to me as someone who attended a PWI and has seen how white college students behave, especially at Big Ten schools where football games cause street parties and even riots. I was maced at one, actually. Anyways, in April 1995, several Atlanta area hotels refused to accept reservations from people traveling for Freak Nick. Some 600 Atlanta residents, mostly business owners, formed the Freak Nick Fallout Group and threatened to initiate a lawsuit against the city if Freak Nick was not shut down. Instead, 
the city put up $1 million for security and cleanup, and according to Atlanta Magazine, implemented an aggressive traffic control plan, blocking highway exits and setting up barricades in popular cruising areas. Still, over 100,000 people showed up. Atlanta Police Chief Beverly Harvard was quoted as being mad as hell that women attending that year's festival had participated in lewd behavior and allowed themselves to be fondled. The Grady Memorial Hospital reported 10 rape victims. The 1996 Freak Nick had a huge police presence. Reported the Atlanta Magazine, City Hall Solution Strangulation by Bureaucracy. In April 1996, Freak Nick became a dry run for Olympics traffic control. APD put 1,500 officers on 12-hour shifts and the city tested its high-tech traffic system. The Georgia Emergency Management Agency opened up its command center and Georgia National Guard troops drilled at metro area armories. Hundreds of no cruising signs were posted around the city, especially in wealthy areas like Buckhead, meaning a lot of the cruising shifted to Memorial Drive, where a police chief said most partygoers had a good attitude and there were fewer than five Freak Nick related arrests. Meanwhile, black students and youth themselves were trying to fix the image of the event. Said the chairperson of the National African Youth Leadership Summit Committee, the locals are the ones who have been in trouble and who have made problems. The group held a hip hop culture forum called Hip Hop, the contract on Generation X, and African Youth Day, a voter registration drive, and a block party with a strict atmosphere. Said the chairperson, the event is geared towards college students. If we represent black intelligentsia, we need to stop exploiting women and acting crazy. But many students weren't interested. A Howard student said she wouldn't go to Freak Nick because I'm not gonna find a good man down there. In 1997, early Freak Nick organizers Sharon Toomer and Suzanne Guy Mitchell submitted a proposal to city council that outlined a new incarnation of Freak Nick with corporate sponsorships, a website with centralized information including do's and don'ts, and designated cruising and 24-hour party zones. The city said no to everything except for a do's and don'ts website. Freaknick.com got 13 million views between January and April 1997. There are a few reasons why Freak Nick 97 was less popping than the ones before. It was in the aftermath of the 1996 Olympics bombing, there was an increased police presence and sanitization, there were anti-cruising ordinances, and a rumor of potential racist violence because the weekend coincided with the anniversary of the Waco siege. So the event wasn't the same, though a bunch of people, including budding rapper Trina, came. The aggressive policing even led to a man named Timmy Sinclair getting beaten and pepper sprayed. A convention held during 1997 Freak Nick threatened to never come back, which would cost the city 18 million in revenue a year. So in 1998, a biracial committee studied Freak Nick and recommended to the mayor that it be shut down. Freak Nick ended up relocating twice to east of Atlanta, attracting much smaller crowds of 50,000 in 1999. With quotas to fill to make the event look extra criminal and to deter future attendees, police arrested 350 50 people, impounded hundreds of cars, and issued thousands of citations. This strategy worked, and by 2000, black college students were going to southern beaches. Plenty of events in the years since have tried to recapture the magic of the wonder years of Freak Nick, but none have succeeded. While rent parties, juke joints, and hip hop block parties still occur today, Freak Nick is the only type of event in this video that solely exists in memories and academic texts, and like theme parties. It has been studied from various angles, including race, gender, cruising culture, sexuality, transportation, consumerism, and even city planning. In 2004, Marion Myers wrote a paper explaining the ways in which the media blamed black women for any sexual assault or harassment they faced at Freak Nick. The upcoming Hulu documentary on Freak Nick will likely address the ways that Freak Nick pose risks to black women. Some people will be angry at the raw recollections of harassment and assault, but those stories need to be told. However, I think it's reductive and insulting to act like Freak Nick was which was initially a net positive, was unique in that it lacked clear communication about rape culture and enforcement of consent. This lack of consent existed in the workplace, on college campuses, during white spring breaks, and at bars and event venues everywhere. I say this not to sanction such rape culture, but to emphasize that Freaknik could have evolved and have been made safer if rape culture overall was mitigated and discussed the way it is today. There are plenty of safe music festivals, street fairs, spring break destinations, and block parties featuring nudity, sexual acts, and drinking and drugs. But black partygoers in Atlanta were made out to be inherently worse, criminal, and uncontrollable. This brings me to my last point. It's important to not strip away the willful expressions of sexuality by women at Freak Nick. Yes, there were black women who were consensually flashing body parts for cash 
or attention, like vintage shake dancers and modern day strippers, or the way people do at Mardi Gras and Folsom Street Fair. Like they film literal porn at Folsom Street Fair. They found a way to make it safe there. Why couldn't we make Freak Nick safer? But maybe Freak Nick was meant to be left in the 90s. Said Freak Like Me singer Adina Howard, Freak Nick was about freedom. It was about just doing you and not being judged at all. Freak Nick was the first time black celebrations of joy and hedonism were thrust into a national spotlight in defiance of respectability politics and expectations of religious morality. But it was just a continuation of other partying. I know I said we'd be discussing four types of black parties in this video, but here's a bonus. As pointed out by historian Stephanie M. H. Camp in The Pleasures of Resistance, Enslaved Women and Body Politics in the Plantation South, deep in the woods, away from slaveholding eyes, they held secret parties where they amused themselves dancing, performing music, drinking alcohol, and courting. She detailed how women at outlaw slave parties made special outfits, did up their appearances, and celebrated with their male counterparts in a secular space of music and resistance, at great risk of whippings or worse punishments from roaming slave patrols. Enslaved people would even squirrel away food and drink from their enslavers to prepare for the festivities, where they cultivated dancing that would become integral to 20th century dance and popular culture. When chided by other enslaved people who were more religious and disapproved, it did no good. Said one Jefferson Henry, they would go off to dances and stay out all night. You couldn't talk to folks that tried to get by with things like that. They weren't going to do no different know-how. Like the other parties we've explored in this video, these clandestine antebellum parties weren't attended by everybody, but they add another shade of variation to the black experience and prove that nothing is new. And this is what what modern black youth and 20-somethings point to when they're judged for letting loose on camera in the modern social media era. People's parents were at Freak Nick doing the same shit they were, with a lot less expectations of bodily autonomy and respect. And remember Rose from that rent party invitation? You can wake up the devil, raise all the hell, no one will be there to go home and tell. They were also at juke joints and rent parties and buffet flats, similarly doing the same shit as Freak Nick attendees, with no cameras and a lot less judgment. Now we have open conversations about rape culture and higher expectations to respect boundaries, but with cameras and much more judgment. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this short tour of black celebrations. If you're one of those people who complains about modern parties or not, which one of these celebrations would you want to attend? Or are you like me and would you go to all of them? I like to party. Be sure to check out more black parties and a black people's history of Christmas and a black people's history of Halloween. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you like and subscribe. If you really like this video, be sure to subscribe to my Patreon for just $1 a month. You get access to all the sources, early looks, at upcoming content and in the process you get to help me continue to make quality YouTube content. The link is in my description box below.